Welcome to Real Estate Investing Unscripted, a podcast from Fund That Flip, where we explore some of the most creative, innovative, and inspiring stories from the real estate investor community. With expert tips and success stories you won't hear anywhere else, you'll come away with inspiration on how to improvise in the unscripted world that is real estate investing so that you can dominate your next real estate deal. Now your host, founder and CEO of Fund That Flip, Matt Rodak. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Real Estate Investing Unscripted. I'm your host, Matt Rodak, founder and CEO of Fund That Flip. And I am very excited about our guest and the insights and perspectives she will be sharing with us on the, uh, on the general real estate market. Um, so our guest today is Margaret Whelan of Whelan Advisory, where she works with both public and private companies on raising the best capital. Um, and a couple of Margaret's uh, initiatives are home builders and single family rental operators, which we'll, we'll get into. Uh, she also sits on the board for three real estate focused companies, one of which is publicly traded. Previously, she was a CFO of a $1 billion company and has been recognized by Forbes and several other well-known publications for her leadership and experience as a finance executive. You know, I feel like I could keep going on and on with all the accolades, but uh, we'll leave it right there for now. Welcome, Margaret, to the show. Thank you, Matt. Good to be here. So appreciate you appreciate you joining us. I, I think uh, maybe if you could just give us a little bit of background on Wheeling Advisory. What are you guys doing? Kind of who do you focus on? How do you help with companies and, and their, their money raising efforts? Sure. Yeah, happy to. So my background is that I've worked on Wall Street and investment banking for more than 20 years, calling on the same Rolodex of clients, which is the national home builders, both public and private, and also the construction companies that primarily focus on residential, whether they're manufacturers, uh, distributors, installers, to those residential home builders. And I worked uh, at some of the bulge bracket firms, UBS and JP Morgan, for about 20 years. And then five years ago in 2014, I started my own business. And the reason was that I wanted to offer a higher level of service, a very bespoke, highly tailored approach to a smaller group of clients so that I could get closer to the teams, really understand and help them determine what they wanted from a capital perspective and then get them into the market. And so the team that I have been working with for the last five years and I, we run six or so deals a year, which is our goal. We tend to work with um, Home builders are local private companies that are getting ready to change the type of capital they have. So in some cases, they'd be going from asset level financing to entity level financing, uh, from land banking to JV equity. They might need a credit facility from the banks. We help them prepare all of that. And uh, in some cases, the, the owner is ready to sell. And we work with international buyers, public company buyers, private equity firms, debt firms, uh, just really working with the clients, holding their hands through the process, helping them really determine what the lowest cost of capital is going to be and how to find it. Got it. So you're, you're primarily focused then on, I guess what I'd, I'd call the client side of helping the builder either either raise capital or perhaps sell their business. You're you're not representing the, the buy side of the transaction. Is that that's, that's right. Okay. Yeah. We, we, we typically represent the sell side. That's our That's our goal and that's what we're good at. Okay. Very, very cool. So I, I think it's safe to say, given that, that you're, you're pretty plugged into what's going on uh, with the housing market at large, particularly with, with builders, it sounds, um, you know, in, in your opinion, kind of, how's the market, you know, what, what should we be expecting, um, you know, as we, as we go into to 2019 here? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a uh, it's a funny time to have to answer that question because <laughs> we're in a, a very seasonal industry, Matt, as you know. And so uh, typically the season, what we call spring selling season, does not kick off until mid-late February in most markets around the country, a little earlier in the southeast and the southwest. And actually, some of our clients in Phoenix and in Florida over the last couple of days have told us that their business has improved quite a bit. It slowed um, across the country starting in midsummer last year, June, July, and that uh, deceleration persisted through the beginning of this year. I think what happened is that um, rates went up quite quickly and we weren't paying attention to that, but they went up to over four and a half percent, which of course on a historical basis is still very low, very compelling opportunity to, to buy at that mortgage rate. But 
on a relative basis, consumers are saying, well, home prices have gone up a lot and rates have gone up. That means my monthly payment is much higher. And what's happening across most industries these days is that the consumer is very well informed. They have access to a lot of information through, through a, you know, an iPhone. Um, they don't have to go to the sales center. They don't have to go to the bank. They have a good sense for what they're going to qualify for. And I think a lot of them just decided to wait it out. Rates have gone up and down a couple of times. There's been a lot of volatility in rates for the last few years. And so they decided to wait. Rates came back down going into the new year, down below that 4.5% level, which seems to have been a catalyst. At the same time, the builders started to offer more incentives um, price discounts or better value packages, and that brought consumers who were on the sidelines or thinking about a purchase into the market. So my sense is that value is very important. The consumer is informed. They know what they want. They want smart homes. They want them built efficiently. They want to know what the HER score is, so they know what the utility bill is every month and they're demanding a higher level of product and service from the home builders and there are builders that are meeting that demand very well and are actually seeing less of a slowdown or better sales momentum over the last couple of months than others gotcha so it's one part we entered kind of the his, you know historically the traditionally slower part of home buying right going into kind of the end of the year season. Or, yeah right the season combined with a combination of rate increases and just just less affordability, I guess, if you will, mm-hmm. um, which slowed things down, which makes sense. Um, so it may just be a matter of time, and let's get through the seasonality piece here and see what happens. We're not we're not in panic mode yet, I don't think. Right, is kind of the safe thing to say. I don't think we're in panic mode. I mean, if you take a step back and look at the big picture, we've been in this recovery for a decade, but on a total uh, overall level, the number of starts that we're expected to generate this year is closer to a trough than a peak. So, and we have no inventory in the system. And if there is inventory building, the SFR REITs come in and and soak it up. So I think they're doing the industry overall a good service because I think they're going to soften the bottom. Um, I don't think there's any reason to panic. The one thing that happened two years ago after the election was that there were a lot of tariffs that led to cost inflation, both lumber and steel, mm. which is pretty significant from a home builder's perspective, and they were trying to pass that along. There were some policy changes on the West Coast starting to mandate all solar or zero net energy homes, which again is, a, is an expense to the builder that they weren't expecting. They were trying to pass that to the consumer. And then there are some labor shortages, which, uh, you know, immigration changed. The, uh, the availability of labor in our industry is much bigger than just a wall going up or immigration. It's, it's really the fact that as an industry, we need to encourage more young people to, qu- to want to come in and build up these trades. But when you put all of that together, the cost inflation was being pushed to the consumer in home price infl- um, inflation and rates were going up. And then the monthly payment got to the point where the consumer said, wow, I don't know if I want to be the, uh, the last buyer in this community buying the most expensive home. I can wait. I, I have a nice rental. I feel good about where I'm living, whether it's my parents' basement or whatever it is. I mean, there there are a lot of great arguments uh, from a demographic perspective for why we should why we're undersupplied right now. Mm-hmm. But I think the inventory is moving over the last six eight weeks. Some folks were worried about that. It really depends on the market, and I think consumer sentiment is good because consumers are employed. There's wage inflation that's offsetting some of the higher costs, and they just need to be encouraged by the builder with a great product to come out and, and uh, really commit to a purchase. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Uh, you, you hit on kind of, I think, um, some of the, the the demographic, what I would consider to be tailwinds, despite some of maybe the headwinds on the affordability. But, you know, I, I read an article the other day in, in Business Insider that more or less kind of tried to lead the reader to believe that, you know, the housing market was on the precipice of a crash, right? And on the other side of that, I look at the data and say, you know, from 2008 to, to you know, present day, we underbuilt historically about six and a half million homes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So like, like the supply still isn't there. And, and there's a lot of talk of, you know, I hate to use the word millennials, right. But mm-hmm. it's the term, right. It's the, it's the largest generation that's really entering now prime first time or second time home buyer. Mm-hmm. So like, what are you, what are you actually seeing on the data, right? If we strip out the doom and gloom of, um, kind of the headlines that want to make us believe that, you know, housing is, is, is falling apart, right? Like 
what are you seeing and kind of what are your builders seeing in terms of, you know, what's actually happening um, from a consumer sentiment and in a demographics and size of buyer pool Mm -hmm. coming into market? So in terms of the demographics, it's a great question. And it's something that builders really need to focus on, which is that you have the older and wealthier millennials buying their first home, which is not a um, a first time buyer purchase. It's often a first move up or second move up home because they have generated some wealth and they've some savings over the last decade. So they're coming in as homeowners later. Um, they also are much more focused on lifestyle. So they don't need a big house. They don't need um, extra bedrooms, three car garage, uh, bonus rooms, big backyards. You know, they, they want to be able to move around. And so the availability of a smaller home that's less expensive, but good value because it's smart or well in a great location because uh, they can Uber in and out to the office or they can work from home. The buyer and, and the demands of the buyer has changed a lot. And there's a group, uh, John Burns, that do a lot of research on this. And when you look at what the consumer wants, I think often there's a mismatch to what the builder is offering. And part of the challenge is that as an industry, the leadership of our industry is what I call PMS, pale, male, stale. (laughs) You know, I think we need to do a better job of really relating to the consumer. You have an industry where leadership is more than 90% male and the buyers uh, making the home buying decision are 92% female. So, you know, there's a disconnect there. And when you talk to folks about design and about marketing, one of the challenges they have is that there's such a long lead time on developing a master plan or a neighborhood or a community, getting it approved, getting it permitted, agreeing on density with the city, and it might be four homes per acre when really the market today is at six. But to have to go back and incur the incremental cost and delays to change that is harder than to just keep the momentum going and and keep uh, offering four homes per acre. So I think that the understanding the millennial is very, very important. I work um, on the capital raising side with some of these new companies, these startups that are coming to the industry. So I spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley meeting with the venture capital investors who, for me, as a, uh, a Gen Xer, I'm in my mid-40s, talking to millennials it's it's interesting it's it's really fascinating and they they challenge me to think about things and they offer perspective that i would never have come up with on my own but one of them told me that his wife was pregnant they were looking for a purchase for the first time in the bay area and they thought a lot of the housing that was available to him would compare to a palm pilot or a blackberry when he wanted to buy an iphone 10 and i thought it was such a good analogy because here you have this couple that's uh, both earning well well educated well informed and just not finding the product that they want to live in and so i think that's what happens with the millennials we also have the issue which i referenced earlier in our industry that young people don't want to come in more people are graduating from university more women than men are graduating now for the first time ever Um, and we have to encourage them to come into our industry and not see it as a cyclical industry where you're going to lose your job every five six years but where you can actually be a part of a company that's well capitalized to survive a cycle or a downturn and, and stay uh stay employed. The other side of the barbell in terms of the demand is not just the mature millennials, it's the mature baby boomers Mm. who are sometimes uh, downsizing or they're buying a second or a third home because they can afford it and they want to go to the Sunbelt belt areas or the southeast off season and you and i sitting here in new york today i, I feel like that would be yeah. very attractive yes <laughs> uh, three, de- three degrees or whatever yeah, yeah minus yes, 50 exactly <laughs> um, so so i think in, and then the um they have more options you know single family rental companies that emerged 10 years ago are now focused on increasing changing their mix or increasing the mix of what I call B2R, build to rent product. And so they're offering those consumers an opportunity to, to use to, to rent a brand new home in a great location with a lot of good amenities because it's often in a big master plan where for sale product is available. But to do it, to rent from a professional manager and they can lock and leave every six months if they want to. So say they can keep their home in the Northeast, but they can buy or rent a second home in the Southeast. And so I think that the, there's a lot more competition. Um, you know, it's interesting. You referenced the fact that we've underbuilt by 6 million homes, but if you look 
at Airbnb and the number of bedrooms that are available. There's actually a lot of oversupply and maybe people are just going to think differently about shelter because they're more lifestyle oriented. They don't need a big house and a big mortgage anymore. So I think the builders that are doing a really good job of um, anticipating what the consumer is going to need. And and it varies dramatically by price point, by where you are in the country, uh, by the type of product that's going to be um, well-received. You have to be nimble with this and constantly anticipating what's around the corner. Yeah. And and I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about the single family rental kind of market in a bit here, but I think, you know, I want to wrap up this idea around, you know, in the, in, in the startup world, we call it product market fit, right? And, and any business has to have product market fit where you're delivering a product that meets kind of the needs of the consumer. So it sounds like a little bit of, of maybe what's happening, especially in some of the, you know, extreme supply constrained markets like San Francisco is, is we have some product there, but maybe it's not the right kind of product. Mm-hmm. I think another big piece of product market fit is affordability, right? Mm-hmm. And, and having product, not only that people want to purchase, but can afford to purchase. Um, and I think a big theme, and you hit on this a little bit, a big theme going into the end of 2018 and into 2019 is, you know, a lot of, a lot of the new construction that had happened um, over the past couple of years had been, at least from, from where I'm sitting on the higher end of the market, because mm-hmm. that was the only way for builders to really make kind of the margins that they needed to make. And that left a lot of the kind of the, the uh, middle, middle of the road construction not happening just because it was so hard to get the land price right and all the materials and everything else. How are, how are, how are folks going after that now? Cause I think we have seen some saturation at the upper end of the market and now the builders are trying to figure out how do we build the, depending on where you're at, the three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollar $600,000 home that, mm-hmm. you know, a larger percentage of the population can actually afford to purchase. You know, it's such a great point, Matt, because it's one thing I've noticed over the last decade is that the builders were addressing the potential for this challenge by buying smaller tracts of land that are closer to the cities, the MSAs where people live and where they're employed. But in turn, that made meant the um, the cost of the home was the price was going to be higher because depending where you're building in the country, the land as a percent of your total cost can be as much as 50%, especially on the West Coast. And then you have to be very efficient with labor and sticks and bricks, which are the other two big components. And so anything you can do offsite in a factory setting to increase efficiencies, reduce waste, really reduce the reliability on skilled labor is can be really meaningful to the bottom line. Um, so builders are doing that, but they're doing it slowly. I think there was no reason to, uh, to worry about it too much until about six, nine months ago when all of a sudden the market started to slow. And now they're coming back to that. Gotcha. So it's really a look for, for productivity levers, right? The, the land's kind yeah. of what the land is and, and the product, because because I would consider myself to be on the upper end of the millennium, millennial spectrum. And like, I don't want to live out on three acres of land where maybe it's more affordable mm-hmm. to build a house, right? Like I want to be in close to somewhere, right? Close to somewhere yeah. where I can walk and get to a coffee shop or jump into you know public transportation and go where I'm going. So the, the answer there is, is just, is, is better productivity, right? Because the, the, yes. the land price is what the land price is for the, for the places where people want to live. Are you seeing more, you know, we, we've, seen, we've seen some of this, especially in like Philadelphia, um, manufactured housing, right? Where they're actually bringing mm-hmm. the house and it's built. It goes from, you know, a foundation to a, to a property in three days. Uh, yes. <laughs> it, it, where do you see that trend going, if, if anywhere? So you're talking about traditional modular product? Yeah, modular product. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So so um, n- new home, if you look at total housing supply, it's 90 plus percent is um, just traditional stick built, stick frames, what we've been talking about with the, that yep. the national builders offer. And then a couple of percent is modular, which I love. And it, it's, you know, 15, 20 percent of supply in a lot of countries around the world for different reasons, which we'll talk about. And then another couple of percent is manufactured housing. Manufactured housing is uh, Clayton Homes. It's it's considered mobile, uh, even though most of them, 90 plus percent, once they're 
set in a park, they don't move. But because of that, the availability of financing is much more restricted, much more expensive, more than twice what it would cost to get a traditional mortgage. Yeah. So modular is fascinating. And there are a couple of companies like uh, Evolution Building Systems in Houston or Plant Prefab in Los Angeles that have what I call a star architect, a, a well-known architect leading the company and leading the design. Hmm. And then they prefab everything in a factory and they get it out to the job site where it's ready, the, the lots are finished and ready to be for the homes to be hooked up and you can literally move in within a couple of days. It's, it's incredible. Um, there's been resistance to modular in the U.S. For, for a reason that I don't understand because I come from Europe where it's much more well accepted and actually expected and, and uh, in some cases people pay a premium for it. I think that's going to change. I think it was just that they were the companies are smaller. They're not as well ca- capitalized. They're operating um, on a local basis. But Plan Prefab actually got capital last year from Amazon, and that was um, that was seen as a big move for Amazon into housing as opposed to just Alexa and smart home uh, mm-hmm. products that they were offering, but really to be a supplier of product. And the thing is that a lot of the home builders, the traditional stick builders, will use a framing component that's prefabricated like trusses or wall panels or a kit that can get installed with a crane in a couple of days that dramatically reduces the number of um, days at the, until the house is weatherproofed and so that there's less delays less cost overruns less theft but with modular you're taking a finished house and installing it via crane and just turning on the light so it's uh, everything that's happening on the innovation side is happening on a spectrum and it's really going to be a function of the availability on the supply side and the uh, the demand on the consumer side i think the demand is there in fact i think consumers would one of the reasons they're reluctant to go out to build a traditional model home these days is because it can take six, nine months until they close and know what their mortgage is going to be. Whereas with modular, if the house is available and they've got a place to put it or it's in a good market, you can actually get it uh, everything finalized within a couple of weeks versus a few yeah. quarters. So I love modular personally. I'm really fascinated by the product. I love going to ULI, the Urban Land Institute, twice a year. Uh, we have meetings where industry executives get together and we get to see a lot of this product that actually gets brought in. There's a group called Casita out of Austin that has these neat little casitas. And uh, I can absolutely see a need for one at some point in my future between my, my parents and my children. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, the, the modular thing kind of confounds me too. I, I, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to tour a few modular home facilities and I was like, this is the future. Like, and you see the house when it's finished and you wouldn't know, you have no, exactly. you, yeah. you wouldn't know that it's modular versus stick built, um, unless you're really, really looking for it. Um, and that was, you know, almost, I don't know, 12, 12 years ago now. And it's kind yeah. of the same, the same place. I think one of the things is, is it's, it's as an industry, it's had a hard time kind of achieving the scale it's needed to get mm-hmm. the, the cost basis, you know, that much, the guys that we do this with in Philly with say it's, it's about as expensive, um, as stick built mm-hmm. currently when you factor in transportation of the, of the boxes and the crane and everything else. Um, but the reason they like it is it, it removes a lot of uncertainty, right? If, if they say the Oh yeah. The boxes are going to get, you know, delivered on X date. They show up on that date because everything is constructed in a controlled environment. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so it'd be interesting. That's one of the things we've got our eye close on too. And I'm, I'm hopeful for, cause I think it's, uh, it's an efficiency gain and it gets to what we're talking about here, which is I think ultimately affordability. How do we deliver product that's affordable? Well, you know, a lot of people in my business are talking about uh, the Japanese companies that have been coming in and buying home builders. A couple of them have had an emphasis on more efficient home builders that factory mm-hmm. build or prefab. But I actually think that Clayton Homes is the company to watch because they've also been buying, been buying um, well-run home builders that use factories like Goodall and um and they are very efficient. And be, I was with Clayton uh, late last year, was in Knoxville at one of their factories. And it's just incredible the, the quality and the efficiency with which they, they get that product out the door. And those are fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 mobile homes. But imagine if they really turned their attention to uh, to 
more traditional modular. Mm -hmm. I think it, permanent modular, I think it would be great to see. The Japanese, it's about 20% of the market. Um, wow. In Europe and different countries, it's in the high teens. So I do think that it's going to come. And uh, I think it'll catch builders by surprise because I think that uh, there's been uh, resistance to it. it. You know, that the product, the quality is not as good or it's it's not as sustainable, but actually it is now with some of these great architects designing very attractive product. I do think it'll be well received. And I think that it'll be a, a awful low base. It'll grow very quickly over the next few years. I think so. And I think, I think Clayton's a Berkshire company, right? So yes, if, anybody, exactly. if anybody can make it happen, uh, <laughs> now Amazon's in, in the mix too, it sounds like. So it's, it's, it's coming. Um, well, I think Amazon had about 20 billion in cash, but, uh, Berkshire Hathaway had about 120 billion. So I would be back in Clayton for all those yes. reasons. Yeah. And they've got some experience in the real estate uh, industry to begin with. So mm -hmm. yes. definitely something to, to keep an eye on. Um, and, and I think generally also good for the country, right? We're talking about, you know, high skilled types of jobs. Like yeah. these are, these are, these are factory jobs that can't really be done outside of the country. <laughs> right. Well, so. Uh, yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a great point, actually, about factory jobs, because some of the resistance to prefab, whether it's component or permanent modular, is just that it increases the, the need for capital, and then there's the risk of cyclicality given the demand drivers and rates and so on. But one of the reasons that it's hard to attract young people into our industry is that the work is usually piecemeal or rate. Um, so you don't always know where you're going to go that morning when you go to work, which job site you're going to be on, what kind of house you're going to be working on, if the sub before you set it up correctly, if it's going to be ready for you. You're subject to a lot of delays. If it's going to rain. If yeah, it's yeah. The, the weather, there, yeah, there are right. so many risks. <laughs> right. And um, whereas in a factory, you're going into the same place every day doing the same job, you can build up your skill set, your efficiency, you can be promoted into leadership roles. And one of the things that's been fascinating to me, because like you, I love factories and I, I go out and I look at them all the time every every year, both in Europe and Asia and then here in the US. But um, the number of women who work in factories, because I don't think that we have a, uh, a labor shortage. I just think we have a lack of process that's enabling other labor opportunities because women who work but also need childcare need to know where they're going to go, when they're going to get home, what, how much they're going to get paid, be sure that they're going to get paid. And you go into some of these factories in Central Florida. Uh, I was there last month and probably half the workforce is female. And so it's great to see it in an industry that's challenged to get women into the, uh, the workforce. That's really, that's really interesting. I uh, hadn't, hadn't thought about that, but yeah, it's a great, great point. Um, we could probably talk about the the uh, the benefits of this all day, but uh, let, let's let's move on to something that we kind of started to get into. So, uh, single family rentals. Um, you mentioned kind of some of the build to rent um, companies and how they're really attracting the the um, the boomer generation that you know wants some flexibility. But I think even more generally, right? Um, I think this applies to millennials and whatever the generation is you know, now below the millennials, which is also a big buyer group is pe people, I think, view home ownership or these generations, I think, view home ownership differently than the boomers did, right? Whereas, whereas I think my parents um, thought of, of a home as a, as the greatest asset one could possess. I think a lot of my generations view it more as a liability, right? Yeah. Than an asset from a, from a payment perspective, from a flexibility, if I need to move for my job, for a lot of different reasons. And, and I think that's been one of the trends that has led to this now emerging market around single family rentals. So maybe just talk to us a little bit about what is single family rentals? Kind of how did the industry kind of start and where do we think it's going? Yeah, it's uh, so. First off, I completely agree with you that it's it's generational in terms of how people value the opportunity to achieve home ownership. And where I'm in my mid forties, and when I was graduating from university, my parents were pushing me, offering me money to help put a deposit on a home, even though I was leaving the country. You know, they're like, "Well, you yeah. have to get on the property ladder." Yeah. And uh, and then you saw. I think the the challenge is that. 
um, everyone lived through that depression 10 years ago. And we housing was really the eye of the storm from the mortgage financing and from the housing oversupply, the spec buyers. And so a lot of consumers got wiped out, families, multi-generations got wiped out, but they also got turned off the... Um, the desire to get on that ladder, like you said, it's not as attractive. And then with some of the tax changes over the last couple of years, it's also, there are not as many incentives to own a home. So, um, but in terms of your question about SFR, single family rentals. So 10 plus years ago, when we had um, hit the downturn very severely, more than people thought. And even 10 years ago, when we were starting 2 million houses a year, people thought that we were under, some people thought we were under supply because the demographics were suggesting there would be more demand than ever before because of the population, the home ownership rate going up and so on. But we ended up with a lot of houses that had been bought or built on spec uh, they, because there was a lot of financing available and, and what they call liar loans. You know, there was just a lot of fraud in the system. And so the market wasn't as stable as people thought. The market changed. There was a ton of oversupply. And I think it was Warren Buffett who was the first to come out. I remember seeing him on CNBC and he said, if I could do one thing right now, I would just buy thousands of single family homes. And right around that, to- that time, Blackstone announced an investment in invitation homes. Um, American Homes for Rent got involved, Tricon. And all, a lot of the companies have consolidated since then. When I was at J.P. Morgan, we worked on some of the IPOs. But these, this industry and this asset class basically has come out of nowhere in the last decade to be very substantial to the point that the market caps of some of these big SFR REITs are bigger than the market caps of some of the biggest home builders in the country. And so... Um, They have established themselves with good credit ratings on their debt, with uh, decent stock performance relative to their NAVs. And the... I think the, the risks that people perceived were one, that it was a trade and that they were going to run out of supply, which they're morphing into build to rent companies now. So that's taken off the table. And secondly, that the maintenance on the houses, the costs were going to be uh, higher than they were anticipating, which we've yet to see that be an issue. And I think in part because of the mix of the product, both new and older homes, uh, helps reduce the average maintenance per house owned or per door. Um, And then beyond that, you just have professionally managed single family homes available. So you've always had 14 million families in the U.S. living in rental homes, but primarily owned by mom and pop locally. And I remember after, um, was it Hurricane Harvey in Houston last year, the year before now, that which was, Houston was a market that there was a lot of oversupply where the REITs, the SFR REITs have a big presence. And they went in immediately after all the water damage with insurance and fixed up those houses faster than anyone um, thought they would. And that really reinforced how professional they are. As an industry, the leadership is much younger than the traditional home builders. And I think that's one of the reasons they're much closer to the consumer. You don't have to uh, call a salesperson to make an appointment and leave work early because the sales office is closing at five o'clock. You can go and just show up and get get access through a lock a lockbox and get in and out very quickly. And so I think the quality of the homes, the quality of and professionalism of the service package overall is very attractive. And that's why it's growing so much. Then separate to that, you have builders, as we talked about earlier, Matt, that have different land positions, different type of product available, a slowdown last year, mid last year, that wasn't expected. In some cases, they've been spec building or they have cancellations. They have product that's available and these uh, SFR REITs will come to them and say, look, we'll, we'll take that off your hands. You can close out of the community and get on to the next one. So it's, they're offering a lot of stability. They're, they're softening the bottom. They're, um, they're challenging the home builders to be more efficient and to be more competitive from a consumer interaction perspective. And I think all of that is positive. Yeah. I, I'm a big believer in the single family rental space. As you said, there's, there's, would you say 14 million people that rent mm-hmm. single family homes? Families, I, think, yeah. I think what's interesting, right, is you look at what, if you can't buy a house, your options historically have been to um, either rent in an apartment building or rent in, rent a house out. Mm-hmm. I, I think the statistic is only 9% of apartment buildings are, are three bedrooms or more, which yeah. means like there's not a lot of inventory in, a, in apartment complexes to rent if you're, you know, 
a kid in or, you know, a second kid in combined with, right, the demographic shifts both on at both ends of the barbell, right? The millennials who don't want to own a home or can't own a home because they're still saddled with just too much college debt with the, the boomers who similarly either already own a home and don't want to own, own a second one or just don't want to own a home again. Um, I think there's going to be a lot more demand for, for, for houses for rent. Yes. Um, I think the other interesting statistic is that, you know, these guys have bought tons of houses, billions of dollars worth of houses. Interestingly, they still only own about 2% of the single family yes. rental market. Yes. Right? It's only like a couple hundred thousand houses of 14 million. So there's so much opportunity for them to grow. Yeah. And, and the fact that they have relatively inexpensive capital and permanent capital is going to really facilitate that growth going forward. And I think yep. that's one of the reasons it's going to mute the cyclicality of the traditional single family market. The other thing that we didn't mention is, um, you know, millennials tend to stay in jobs for less time on average than their predecessors, whether it's the Gen X or the baby boomers. They don't buy a home for life. They don't take a job for life. They move around more. And so they want to have that flexibility. You also have more women graduating from university now than you've ever had before. So you often have two incomes. And so um, maintaining flexibility in case one of the two of you decides that you need or want to move for professional advancement is important. And so all of those reasons, along with the fact that you, the supply is available for a great home and a great new home that's professionally managed, I think all of that makes it very compelling from a consumer's perspective. Absolutely, they're, they're adding more services, um, which ultimately helps them be more efficient and which ultimately drives bottom line and helps everybody win. So I think it's, I think it's a great thing. It's hopefully will continue to, to trend up. All right, so let's uh, let's move on here to the last segment of our show here, and that is related to uh, the theme of the show, which is real estate investing unscripted. As I'm sure you've seen on multiple different front, things happen no matter how well you plan for, you know, a capital raise or a project or whatever it may be. Do you, do you have a good story? Maybe you could share with the audience of something that was a a gotcha moment on a capital raise or a, or. or a development project or something that, you know, you could share that we could all learn from? Um, I thought about that question, Matt. I think that you always need to be prepared. And one of the things we do with our clients when they approach us and ask us to represent them on a capital raise is meet with the finance team, make sure they have historical financials are audited, that their cash flows are accurate, that there's a strong controller in place. A couple of things went wrong mid last year when demand changed so much and costs went up. So a lot of the EBITDA projections were moving around. And in two cases, we had to negotiate uh, on behalf of our clients because the earnings power was different to what we had hoped. But you just, you know, I think that the, um, what, what's more important is the integrity and the intentions of both sides, which is that we want to partner. We want to figure that out. Things are not what we thought, but here's why. And being transparent about that so you can try to keep moving forward. It's it's like they say, right? The the, the crime's never as bad as the cover up. So not not yeah. suggesting that a crime was happening here, but as as <laughs> yeah. number as numbers change and they will, yeah. like, like yes. it's okay, right? As long as you've got yeah. well intended parties and you can be transparent and upfront about it and and um there's still usually a deal to be done uh, yes. as long as everybody understands what they're buying. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we help them to negotiate the term so that if there's more profitability coming later versus what was originally expected to be um, delivered already, that the owner will get a bigger share of that. Just to, just to earn out on the back end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still, and still earn out. Done. Yeah. yeah. yeah Makes exactly. Sense. Most of the buyers right now are looking for majority position over 51% so they can okay. consolidate the earnings on their own um, yep. financials. And so then the question from our client's perspective is where do you want to be between 51 and hundred? Yep. Got it. Well, this has been great. I feel like we covered a lot and could probably go deeper in, in a lot of these different subjects. So we'll have to have you back on sometime soon. But um, in the meantime, if folks want to get a hold of you or learn more about your services, um, what's the best place for them to, to get in touch? Yeah, they can find me on LinkedIn. I post actively. I speak at a couple of conferences a month. So I, I think I met you at a conference. I meet a lot yep. of people at conferences or our website is wheelandadvisoryllc.com. 
check it out. Wheeland advisory, LLC.com. Uh, look up Margaret Wheeland on LinkedIn and, um, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much for, uh, for being here with us. I think if I could kind of summarize some of the points is, uh, I think a big one is that, you know, if you're, if you're a builder, um, or a, or a flipper, I guess, for that matter, like the consumer is, is more informed than they've ever been and, and delivering the right value is important. I think the other thing that kind of jumped out to me is how important technology is becoming in, in kind of the home buying process. And I think that's both on the, on the, on the upfront part, right. Of, you know, being able to qual- self-qualify and look at some product before you even go on site. And then also the technology, that, <clears throat> excuse me, people are looking to be delivered in their homes, right. Um, energy efficient and, and a lot of other things. And then I think the other the other big takeaway here is we got to keep an eye on single family rental. I think it's going to continue to be a, a growing segment of the of the residential real estate market, and is going to be um, something that impacts new builders, flippers, speculators, a lot of other folks that are, are playing in in our space. Any final any final part parting thoughts? No, I think that's a good summary. You had asked about what's the market outlook going to be. I think that the fact that consumers are looking for smaller homes of better value means starts are probably going to start to rise again here and that the uh, the kind of down spirits that people are feeling are going to lift. I think we'll have a nice spring selling season. Yes, good 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 point. No, we're not we're not in panic mode. No one's in panic mode. We're in, we're yeah. good. Don't don't believe all the doom and gloom <laughs> out there, guys. It's not Take real. Advantage of it. Take advantage of it. That's right. Well, thank you again, Margaret. Really appreciate your time and having you on here and sharing sharing your insights. This was this was great. And uh, thank all of you for listening. Be sure to check out our website, fundthatflip.com. Our blog has uh, a lot of other great resources. Also, if you're looking for funding for new construction or um, or any type of uh, renovation loans, check us out at fundthatflip.com. Otherwise, look forward to uh, to next time. Your host, Matt Rodak, signing off.